episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Uh, we're honored today to be joined by Brian Moirescu, who is the author of the book, The Immortality Key, uh, The Secret History of Religion with No Name. Uh, Brian graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Brown University with a degree in Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. Uh, he's also an alumnus of Georgetown Law School and a member of the New York Bar and has been practicing law internationally for the last 15 years. Uh, Brian is also the founding executive of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, uh, whose work has been featured uh, on CNN, ESPN, uh, Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, and a variety of other media. Uh, and in uh, 2018, he was involved with uh, the NFL and uh, represented the first professional athlete in the United States to seek uh, therapeutic exemption for the uh, use of cannabis. Uh, Immortality Key is his debut book. Um, so welcome, Brian Mareska, to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Ira. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, Brian, I, I, we, we typically start the show off by giving our guest the floor for a little bit uh, just to talk about uh, sort of the background and journey to date. Um, if you could sort of take us on a little uh, trip in terms of who you are, where you grew up, and a little bit of how you've sort of gone through uh, uh, the history, the classics, the practice of law, and ultimately what brought you to write this fascinating book. Um, please take the stage. Okay, so long story short, I'm a 40-year-old attorney, ordinarily based in Washington, D.C., uh, the father of two beautiful daughters, happily married to my wonderful wife. Uh, at, at the moment, we are in Uruguay, in South America, where my wife was born and raised, which happens to be one of the most COVID-free countries in the Western Hemisphere. So I, I kind of won the lottery uh, for the next few months. Uh, so when I, when I wasn't practicing law over the past 12 years or so, um, I was really diving as deep as I possibly could uh, into this, this mystery. Uh, and not, not just any mystery. It's what Houston Smith, one of the greatest religious scholars of the 20th century, called the best kept secret in history. This idea that there was an original sacrament there was some kind of beverage that transformed mortals into immortals and welcomed everybody from Plato to Marcus Aurelius in the ancient world. And, and the intriguing possibility that something like that may have actually been the basis for the original Eucharist, or, or at least the Eucharist that, that was used in some Greek-speaking communities in the ancient Mediterranean. And it was a big, you know, controversial hypothesis uh, that was launched in 1978. And there wasn't a lot of like scientific data to prove it one way or the other. So I picked up this mystery in about 2007 when I started reading about the psilocybin experiments at Johns Hopkins University. And th this idea that people would have a one and only dose of, of psilocybin and walk away talking about this, this mystical experience. Now, now, of course, it would have an impact on, on, on therapeutics, things like depression, anxiety. But at, at the end of it, as you keep reading this, this literature, coming out of Hopkins and NYU, uh, you, you hear people talking about this life transforming experience. And, and to me, it was very similar to the way the ancients described their experience under this best kept secret, you know, the, this idea of, of a hidden sacrament and secret recipes. Uh, so from, from that moment on, I was looking through all these old journals and trying to find scientific data to support the idea that there were actually psychedelics. In antiquity. And at some point, it took me on the road to, to Greece, looking at these archaeological sites. I went to the Louvre uh, to see a special collection. I went through the Vatican, uh, through the secret archives and the catacombs. Uh, I talked to all the experts that I could across all those disciplines uh, that you mentioned at the beginning. And at, at the end of it, I present hard data uh, for the use of, of psychedelics, which, which I say is really just proof of concept for what I think is the next 10 years of a very multidisciplinary search. You know, going back to um, sort of the ancient world, you uh, you talk and you write uh, a lot about what you refer to as the the spiritual capital of the ancient world, uh, that this area known as Eleusis in in Greece. Um, for for those of you less familiar, sort of with the classics and, and sort of this part of history, can you just Talk a little bit about this part of the story and why this sort of uh, forms sort of the uh, the background to a lot, which then you uh, write about moving forward in history. But sort of what Eleusis was all about, and sort of sort of this original um, potion, uh, let's say that uh, is spoken mm -hmm. about in, in in some of these texts. 
Yeah, so ancient Greece is, is kind of my axis. And, uh, you know, the, the use of drugs, we think, goes back much, much further. And in, in my book, I trace it back at least 12,000 years to that moment when we're leaving the caves for the cities at the agricultural revolution. It probably goes back tens of thousands of years uh, beyond that, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. These are huge open questions. But I use ancient Greece as the axis because they seem to have inherited another tradition that was present throughout prehistory, which I call the religion with no name. This idea that uh, this sacred pharmacopoeia wound its way into different civilizations over time. Uh, but, but the Greeks should capture our attention because it's, it's, where, it's where we come from. Uh, you know, they were the, the beneficiaries of other traditions that came their way from North Africa and the Near East. But when we think of the democracy and arts and sciences that we take for granted today, it came through the filter of the Greeks. And you know, something that, that should jump out at you is that, you know, these people who drafted the blueprints for everything we take for granted in Western civilization uh, didn't believe that Zeus was on a mountaintop hurling thunderbolts at us. I mean, these, these were smart, sophisticated, very skeptical people. They gave us the word skepticism uh, from skeptomai, which means to look around in Greek. So I, I always thought it was really ironic that, that the people who were this smart and, and created all this stuff somehow came up short on the meaning of life, which of course wasn't the case. I mean, yes, they had philosophy and, uh, and book learning, uh, are, you know, and literature are the things that we also inherited from them. But what the Greeks equally had was this fascination with death. And they incorporated that fascination into these mystery schools. Uh, and the most famous was the mysteries of Eleusis, what I call the ancient spiritual capital of the Mediterranean. It, it existed all the way through ancient Greece and into the Romans as well. I mean, for centuries and centuries, it, there was this temple dedicated to the goddess Eleusis, the goddess of the grain, that called to initiates. They would make this parade from Athens, the capital, up to Eleusis, where at some point they would drink a potion and have this vision, uh, this vision of the goddess. And in their words, almost universally, they talk about a beatific vision that guaranteed them the afterlife. Right? So, so only those who had been to this temple, experienced this initiation, would be guaranteed some kind of life after death, which raises a very big question, like, like what was going on there? Which is why Houston Smith calls it the best kept secret, because it was, it was all secret. Nothing was written down. There was no doctrine, no dogma. Uh, we're talking about an oral tradition that survived for hundreds of years, if not thousands, uh, before the Greeks. And this intriguing possibility that maybe it was a psychedelic because the, the thing that comes up again and again is this notion of a vision and very you know gold standard classical scholars and historians will talk about that vision but it was only in 1978 that this this trio of renegades launched this controversial hypothesis that it was indeed psychedelics and and you know staying back in in that era let's say um and you mentioned uh, obviously at least in the sort of the Abrahamic uh, context, uh, we have all these uh, stories of visionary experiences from, from Moses in the burning bush, uh, Muhammad meeting the angel Gabriel and so forth, uh, either, you know, these uh, connections to some deity or a representative of the deity meeting this person. Um, I was just wondering, as you explored many of these and other stories that may be less familiar with, what percent of them would you say had something to do with uh, the person undertaking the visionary experience, uh, meeting some entity, let's say, of this religion, or the, sort of the reverse, um, you know, because a lot of these experiences have less to do with, you know, uh, finding that uh, deity, let's say, or, as opposed to experiencing it themselves. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into sort of the concept of, you know, experiencing God and all this later, but, um, Where's the breakdown there? Is it just the Abrahamic religions that, hey, uh, there's this invisible guy over here that you, or uh, are the majority of these experiences a little uh, less oriented in that context? I think it's, it's a very, very widespread. Uh, I mean, how does an invisible deity become real? I mean, how does the invisible become visible? How do religions get started? Uh, I mean, I don't know the percentages or the proportions. I know that the use of plants and mind-altering drugs is very widespread when you look at human culture, separated in time and space all over the planet, including the Abrahamic faiths. And I'll quote, uh, which I do in my intro, the Benedictine monk David Steindl-Rasht. He says, there is no other way to start a religion 
Uh, so not, not to say psychedelics, but mystical visionary experiences. So it's not just in Judaism or Islam. I mean, at the heart of Christianity, it's greatest evangelist, Paul, who wrote, you know, ha more than half the books of the New Testament. He never met Jesus, right? Uh, in, in the flesh, right? He meets Jesus through these auditory hallucinations. And he talks about being caught up in the third heaven and struck blind on the road to Damascus. Peter in Acts is described explicitly as entering into trance. Uh, and the, the religious scholar Elaine Pagels at Princeton, whose work that I reference a lot on early Christianity, she also says something similar to Brother David, that, you know, visionary experiences are, are, are the core of this stuff. I mean, I mean, and if you think about it logically, how else could religion really, you know, be born? It's, this, it's something supernatural and extraordinary that does not fit into the breakfast, lunch, and dinner of your average day. I mean, it's so weird, and it's, it's just, it's so anomalous that whoever experiences this stuff wants to talk about it and share it and try and capture it. Uh, and in sharing those stories, you know, these, these myths develop and these narratives develop and eventually they become doctrine and dogma. And eventually, you know, they turn into bureaucracies and things that, you know, help recapture that original experience. But, you know, at its, at its root, you're talking about something that that's inexplicable, a direct encounter with something divine. As you uh, did your research, you uh, enlisted the help of, of um, some scholars with some very unique capabilities. You, you know, you refer to sort of the sacred pharmacology, uh, and, and you you met with folks like um, uh, Dr. Pat McGovern here at uh, Penn, who you know is known as sort of the Indiana Jones of sort of ancient wines and beverages, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Coe at MIT, who's the background in anthropology and so forth. And I, I love these disciplines because I, I love the fact they still exist and I, I wish sort of there was more attention paid to them. I, I was just very interested in sort of um, some of the interesting um, stories or some of the, the specific research that these folks are doing that you specifically were most intrigued by. And then also in that context, you know, a lot of, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a pharmacist by undergraduate training and I had a few semesters of pharmacognosy. Ah. Um, and I was always amazed by, you know, we, we have hundreds of thousands of say, plants out there in the um, in sort of nature, but, you know, you know the, we, we study very few of them. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm always interested in sort of, um, uh, you know the how difficult it is for some, when you're when some of these folks are dealing with uh, stuff that's thousands of years old to, to really do this work and understand hey what was in this particular vase or jug or whatever talk a little yeah. bit through sort of th these relationships as you cultivated them and some of the things, interesting things that you found yeah research. i mean that's what really kicked my investigation into into high gear was coming um across the scholarship of, of Pat McGovern at UPenn and Andrew Coe at MIT. I mean, so the psychopharmacology and, and what happens inside the brain was, was part of the story. And, you know, immediately I noticed that similarity between some of the modern experiments and what's described in antiquity. But I mean, to really get granular and, and convince myself as a skeptic, right? As a curious skeptic, sure. I wanted to see the hard data that there was actually drugs. And antiquity. And if you go to the world's leading archaeobotanists, archaeochemists, um, paleoethnobotanists, the people who study this stuff in antiquity, you don't see a lot of hard data for psychedelics. Uh, but what you do see are really weird beers and wines. Um, and so it was, I think it was McGovern's study that was published in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. And you can Google this, um, Ancient Egyptian Herbal Wines. Uh, I came across that at the very beginning of my research. And uh, Pat McGovern uh, tested these vessels that were turned up, 700, 700 wine jars in Egypt at Abydos, which we think belonged to Scorpion I. So pre-dynastic, 3150 BC, a heck of a long time ago. And when these jars were subjected to chemical analysis, they didn't just show, show wine. They, they showed wine spiked, spiked with different plants and herbs. So in this case, it was wine spiked with everything from savory, wormwood, blue tansy, balm, senna, coriander, germander, mint, sage, and thyme. I've been rattling those off in, in my brain over the past few months because it's, it's weird. It's, I mean, it's weird to see that conglomeration. A few years later, Andrew Coe at MIT uh, made a lot of headlines for discovering uh, what was called the world's oldest wine cellar um, in, in Galilee. Uh, and it was a similar kind of wine, in this case, 40 jars that were spiked with, with different ingredients. So things like honey and storax and terebinth uh, and even cinnamon, right? So 
with some of those ingredients, Andrew Coe says clearly it has something to do with, with like the, the, um, the aromatics or the flavor profile. In some cases, like in terebinth, it's just preserving the wine. But then in other cases, you really are talking about substances that may have been cultivated for their psychoactive or maybe even psychotropic effect. And that, that's, that's the big question. Were they, were they consciously spiking their wine for religious purposes? So all of a sudden, this crazy idea from 1978 to me became a lot less crazy. And I, I furiously went through all these journals looking for more and more data to, to I mean, you know, basically persuade myself that ancient wine was a very, very different thing than we think of today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting story about a, um, a, a terminally ill patient named, I think, Dinah, who mm -hmm. um, is at the NYU study. And although an atheist, you know, part participates in the study for the terminally ill, um, coming away with, you know, uh, a substantially reduced fear of, of dying. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about sort of the, um, that area of the sort of the pharmacotherapeutic uh, studies, sort of the modern pharmacotherapeutic studies in, in sort of reducing uh, these fears, especially fear of death. And then also, I, if, you know, one of the sort of the discussions I always hear when I, when I talk to some of these folks is sort of how important um, in certain cases, whether it's for depression or addiction, whatever, the, the visionary component is of the psychedelic experience versus the neuropharmacologic stuff that's happening. Some people think the visionary is not that important. Some people think it's much more important than the, pharma the pharmacology. Um, any interesting insights there, especially when you talk about sort of the, the fear of dying and, and, and this particular mm -hmm. clinical niche? Yeah, I mean, th so that, that was the insight that, that blew my mind. I mean, to, to answer the, the first question just very quickly, as folks probably know, we're living through somewhat of a psychedelic renaissance. Um, and this has been happening for years. Uh, you know, uh, th this stuff was studied in the 50s and 60s, by the way, and, and wasn't that controversial until the war on drugs. Uh, there's a long hiatus in research for a couple decades, by and large. And then in the early 2000s, it's Bill Richards and Roland Griffiths at Hopkins who really get this up and running again um, with, with government, uh, government approval, obviously. And so now we're at the point in 2020 where something like MDMA, uh, which maybe isn't a classic psychedelic, but it, it's already in phase three trials. And you do have psilocybin. Uh, uh, you know, in 2016, there was that joint publication by Hopkins and NYU, specifically looking at its uh, impact on end of life distress. And I interview Dinah Baser, who went through that experience for that reason. But I mean, all the researchers I talk to are fairly confident uh, that within the next uh, who knows, five years, give, give or take, the FDA will probably approve psilocybin, for example, uh, for any number of clinical applications. We don't know how it's going to happen or which comes first, but we, we have seen data on anxiety, depression, uh, end-of-life distress. You could see applications for PTSD, um, uh, addiction, I mean, all kinds of things. But, but the reason you see it, and, and, and this is the answer to your second question, the reason well, you know, we, we see it have this effect, this therapeutic effect on so many different diagnostics, right? This, this cross-diagnostic efficacy is because at its core, and if you talk to like a Tony Bossis at NYU, one of the researchers, I mean, I talk to him a lot about this. If you're really trying to, to uncover what's happening there, uh, you just listen to the, to the volunteers. Uh, and what they talk about is a mystical experience, which is why I, I start the book with Dinah Baser, who describes herself as an atheist. And through one and only dose of psilocybin, again, under a carefully controlled con conditions, uh, beautifully set up in, in this programmatic way at NYU, uh, she talks about encountering something mystical. And she says that she arrived at this insight that every moment is an eternity of its own. It's, it's kind of like getting a very big picture. I mean, pulling back on all the pain and stress that accompanies, especially someone at the end of life or someone with a life-threatening illness, uh, but it's this idea that it's not just the neuroscience because the psilocybin, you know, it's metabolized by your body in six hours and then it's gone. But what, but what endures and what persists, not for months, but for years, is this memory. This, this memory that you encountered something life-transforming, that you touched something. Uh, I'll use the word numinous, that you, you touch something that, again, you don't see in other aspects of your life. It's so weird, so anomalous, that, of course it has this therapeutic effect, but it's really something existential. I mean, the idea that, that you are something more than the body, which 
which sounds weird and you know very ontological, but it's for some reason we don't know why it has an impact on people. Uh, and whatever is happening in NY, NYU and, and Hopkins, it's happening uh, with, with such repeatability that it's it's something really really fascinating. When you know you you start off the book with a this quote. Um, I, I, I forget the origin of it, but basically, if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. And, you know, it feeds into this component, once again, to the uh, sort of this obliteration of, of the fear of death and sort of the mm. melting of, you know, the way sort of psychedelics for those that experience them quite, you know, they talk about sort of this dissolving of the self and experiencing, you know, that there's much more going on be, <laughs> beyond just yourself. Um you know, I, I, once again, going back to sort of the, the, the psychopharmacological stuff, um, hmm. you know, if, if you take sort of the, the hallucinogens for a moment and you, you divide them up into, you know, there's these subclasses, right? You got your psychedelics, but you also have your, you know, your dissociative agents and, and even weirder, uh, your deliriance, which is a fascinating. I had Sharon Inouye on from Harvard uh, a few months ago. And so delirium is uh, like psych psychedelia is another one of those really, <laughs> <laughs> if you ever experienced it, the only thing that one can comp you know compare it to is sort of you know that that moment when you wake up from a dream uh, and and you know, spend about a half hour realizing, wait, I'm not you know I'm not hitchhiking uh, with Frank Sinatra, just <laughs> so all that bit. Um, you, you mentioned in the book, you know, touch on things like, for instance, uh, the, the belladonna and, and some of the nightshades and all that, which are you mm. know are let's let's say psychedelic than they are deliriant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just, as we have these subcategories, one sort of the psychedelics, which dissolve the self, the dissociatives, which sort of do the, op, you know, they're sort of the Brad Pitt fight club. Hey, there's somebody in this room with me that's not there. And then delirians where you're gone, where you don't even realize that. Um, any interesting things more related to the the associative and deliriant effects of some of these oddball, uh, there's there are weird chemicals, but in, in historical use of these things, mm. as opposed to straight psychedelics. And I know, I'm sorry for the long-winded question here, but I'm always intrigued by that. <laughs> some of those other uh, oddball classes of hallucinogen that do really weird things to us beyond yeah. sort of dissolving the self, let's say. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's actually, the way you say it is, uh, no one's ever phrased it that way, which is really important. It's, 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 it's critical to the book, actually, because I went out looking for everything. I went out looking for all kinds of drugs. I had no, you know, pre-existing thoughts about it. Um, uh, I looked for mushrooms, you know, I looked for classic psychedelics. You know, you don't find classical psychedelics no. in antiquity. I mean, I went out looking for LSD, you know, which, which you can't do. Uh, because it wasn't quote unquote discovered till 1938. We don't have a very, very um, good record, right? A, a, a paleo ecological, paleo ethnobotanical record for mushrooms. It's just, it's, 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 it's the case. You can find some data, but it's very, it's very spotty. DMT, uh, another thing, dimethyltryptamine for those who are aware, the, the, you know, these classic hallucinogens. <laughs> of course I went looking for that. And of course I looked into all the theories about Akashia. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't find anything hard. What I found in, in the old world, what I found in Europe, uh, not just in the literature, but in the actual archaeobotanical data, what I found uh, were, were things like cannabis. And I found opium, which is very prevalent. And I found the nightshades, which, you know, yep. I didn't go out looking for nightshades, but I found these delirians. Yep. What, what I found about them, uh, and, and to be clear, when we're talking about these nightshade plants, for those who aren't aware, it's things like, like mandrake, uh, in the Solanacea family. It's things like deadly nightshade, Atropa yep. belladonna. Um, I found a lot of henbane for some reason. Oh, yeah. uh, and I, I, I couldn't really explain why I was finding these things. But, you know, these ancient Greek writers like Theophrastus writes a lot about these. Uh, Dioscorides, I mentioned him a lot, the father of drugs in the first century AD. You know, he's not writing about what I can tell. He's not writing about psilocybin containing mushrooms. Mm. He's not writing about DMT or LSD. He's writing about these nightshades, uh, these, these delirians. But he's writing about them in such a way that, you know, the visionary properties weren't lost on these people. And, and I mentioned this, this one recipe in particular. You know, Dioscorides has dozens of recipes for spiking wine with these different plants. And he says spiking your wine with mandrake, for example, can be medicinal at the right dose and fatal 
at, at the at the other dose. Yep. Uh, and he says, you know, uh, e even combining them with certain things can produce visions. I mean, so he, they were aware of these psychedelic visionary like properties of these things. And uh, what, what was really interesting for me on the search is that I did find them uh, in in wines like this, this incredible wine discovery from outside Pompeii. Uh, dated to 79 AD, just after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in this old pharmacy called the Villa Vesuvio, 20 years ago, uh, which was discovered and just kind of underreported was wine that was spiked. We found seeds of cannabis, opium, henbane, and black mm. nightshade. So it, it shows you that <laughs> this stuff just wasn't just in the literature. Uh, it actually existed in real life. And we don't know why this wine was consumed if it was consumed at all, and you got to be careful about extrapolating this stuff, but I mean, sure. there really was uh, this sacred pharmacopoeia floating around the ancient Mediterranean, and it largely goes missing, I think, during the Inquisition, when these sacred plants and herbs uh, come under attack, right? All this traditional knowledge and this folk healing and folk medicine, uh, it's there in antiquity, and you know, as you know, it, it disappears. And, and so, you know, today, it's hard to look back and find that sacred European tradition. We're more likely to think of the Amazon or Iboga, you know, or different African sure. plants. You know, there, there, there is evidence that this really was at the roots of Western civilization as well. Yeah, it, it's interesting when you, when you talk about a formulation like that, because, you know, so much of the, you know, prior to the, uh, the discovery or the synthesis of aspirin about 100 years ago, mm -hmm. that's what the, the medicines were. They weren't this purified, you know, uh, substance, but they were these interesting combinatorial mixtures of stuff and hey they, they work for the thousands of years and you know some sort of reconnecting with this uh these unique properties uh, that you know you can't isolate uh, just one thing but maybe there are interesting mixtures out there that and that's why i think you know as i said before the uh some of these folks you're talking to that are experts <laughs> this is stark pharmacopoeia there's mm -hmm. something still there for today's world and it's uh, that's why we got to keep people in those disciplines it's uh, it's very important um, you know, in the tag or the, your publishers sort of the tagline for the book, aside from, um, you know, talking about sort of the groundbreaking dive into the role psychedelics played in the origin of Western civilization, uh, you know, it mentions the real quest for the Holy Grail that could shake the church to its foundations. And the, the interesting thing here, you know, I've been spending the last few months, a lot of time with. Uh, well, it's like people on both ends of the spectrum, right? I, I, uh, on one hand, I have uh, folks like Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia from the Vatican and Dupton Jimpa, who was the Dalai Lama's translator. And all these other folks uh, that are realizing, you know what? Um, there is some interesting stuff that science is going to <laughs> impart upon mm -hmm. our respective theologies. On the other hand, uh, I have... Uh, quantum physicists and quantum biologists, and I had a quantum chemist last week, uh, multiverse cosmologist Vitaly Venturin from University of, uh, of Minnesota, that realized, you know what, there's something spiritual to this science that we're doing. <laughs> I, I'm just interested, I, 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 you know, I get shaken the church, but at the same time uh, in 2020, as you're talking about sort of the use of these things now, uh, it seems like there's some... Uh, people opening up their minds on both sides of the spectrum that realize, hey, there's a place for this stuff, not just in medicine, but sort of in this spiritual scientific linkage. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's not a question there, but I'm just going to hand that one back to you if you want to talk about <laughs> sort of, are there people in the church that aren't being shaken that you run into and vice versa in the scientific world? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I found is that if, if it's shaking anybody, um, it's, it's shaking the, the religious and not, not, not in a terrible way, just in, in a way of alerting them maybe to a conversation they weren't aware of. I mean, the fact that, that so many different disciplines have been investigating this. So not just, not just the psychopharmacology, uh, but the archaeochemistry, going out and looking for hard data for the use of this stuff, uh, is really ramping up. And these are relatively new disciplines. I mean, archaeochemistry in particular, just over the past couple couple decades. But you know, we now know um, with pretty high degree of confidence that this stuff was used in antiquity. And I'll just mention before I answer your question, I'll mention one you know hard piece of data just to kind of frame it, which is early. It was only earlier this year, but earlier this year in May a paper was released by a group of Israeli researchers. And what they found were the remains of cannabis 
uh, on these limestone altars dating to the 8th century BC at Tel Arad. And they, they describe it in their paper, in this you know, peer-reviewed paper, as uh, some of the earliest evidence, if not the first evidence, for the use of psychoactive drugs in, in, in ritual, right? ritual that becomes Judeo-Christian. Uh, it's it's so the, the idea that there was cannabis infused incense is now an archaeochemical fact, or at least as much as we can prove through the science. So when you have something like that, it raises well-founded questions like what was happening in ancient Judaism? What was this, this incense or the holy anointing oil? And again, very well-founded questions about the Eucharist. Uh, what kind of wine was being served in this proto-mass, uh, in this period that I call paleo-Christianity? which is this, you know, this, the 300 years between the death of Jesus and the legalization of Christianity. If what was happening there, and it's a big if, but if what was happening there was the use of some of these crazy wines, like that, 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 that entourage wine of opium, cannabis, and henbane that I found in Pompeii, I mean, what does it mean for the roots of, this, of, the, of the church? How did this religion spread to Greek speakers who were very familiar with these recipes and these visionary types of wines? Uh, I think it's a question worth asking, especially given what's happening inside the lab with these mystical experiences. Um, are these genuine mystical experiences? If so, and if it's been happening across time, what does it mean for the future? Which is the big question, actually, for the, for the book is, what, what does this mean beyond therapeutics? And I'm happy to inform you that, I mean, I've been talking to lots of priests in and outside of the Vatican, and no one is really shocked or, or scandalized by this. I mean, I want to be careful with my language. I'm not trying to blaspheme anybody or anything. I'm not saying that Jesus was high on drugs or this is what was happening at the Last Supper. But if these religions are born on visionary experiences, I mean, the hypothesis that I'm pursuing here is the notion that the earliest followers would have tried any means possible to recapture that, right? Because we're not all born natural mystics and nat natural visionaries and saints, right? Uh, it doesn't seem to happen that often. But if there's technology to guide people through a genuine religious experience, right? Um, it's something that, that, that ought to be considered today. Uh, and so I'm not sure where it goes, but even if you think about end of life distress in particular, uh, you know, the use of one of these, you can call them drugs, uh, you can call them a sacrament, but the use of one of these sacraments, for example, at the end of life, if it has the ability to uh, encourage uh, this, this, this uh, transformation of consciousness, right? Where someone's looking forward to their death and, and makes real all the promises of, of the gospels, right? And this life after death. I mean, it's something that I think that there's an opportunity for organized religion to really, to embrace this, make it their own and make it something sacred. What would the modern Eleusis, uh, the Eleusis of the modern world, look like to Brian Morescu? Uh, if, you, <laughs> if a trillion dollars dropped down from the sky tomorrow and you, really, you, know, you could go build your, some city in the middle of wherever, what, what would that entail, you think? What would it, I'm saying moving past, obviously, FDA in the next uh, yeah. couple decades, approving all sorts of stuff therapeutically, but what would a, um, a modern spiritual elusis uh, look like to you, you think? I'll, I'll be happy to speculate. Okay. Uh, so, you know, this is this so this this is this would happen after legalization and regulation you know I, I think you will see some centers i mean in fact in oregon in two years you're going to see a center i mean oregon is the first jurisdiction in the world where they are regu not just legalizing but regulating psilocybin for therapeutic purposes and so the regs are being drafted you're going to see a center in two years so i mean your question isn't off base because it is it's already happening but my my bigger question for like for me as someone who hasn't done psychedelics, by the way, I'm not sure I've mentioned, but I'm a virgin because I recognize the therapeutic effect. But, you know, part of me in my own identity crisis does see the benefit for this on my on my faith. Uh, and I still consider myself a Christian after 13 years of Catholic school, mm -hmm. growing up in Philly and, and studying with the Jesuits. And, you know, they taught me to ask questions. And, and I feel like that's what I've been doing. And when you ask me that, you know, uh, I think about what the ancient Greeks would have done. I also think about what the ancient Christians would have done. And what I see time and again are people who really approach these sacraments with reverence. So in my case, let's say it's 10 years from now, there's this beautiful retreat center um, out in the woods somewhere. Um, and before you even consider 
heading to this elusive site, what you're doing is preparing. Uh, so, you know, I talk about preparing for months, if not years in advance. That's what happened at Eleustis. You didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I want to drink the magic potion. You would go through, uh, uh, you know, an initiation before that. Uh, and in fact, you weren't um, initiated into the full secrets at Eleusis until your second visit. You would do all the pomp and circumstance, get there and only become a first level initiate. It was only on your second visit that you would have the vision. Uh, so uh, I envision a couple years of really intense emotional, psychological preparation, even spiritual preparation, whatever that means to you. If you're a person of faith or no faith or somewhere in between, I mean, just something to help contextualize this, you know, look at your shadow and just kind of acknowledge all those nasty parts of yourself and, you know, examine your relationships uh, and come to that experience with a really clear conscience or, or as clear as possible. Because what I found time and again is that it's not the drug, that there, there is no God pill. It's not this magic thing. It's not a wonder drug. What, what, what it seems to be, which is even more mysterious and more beautiful, is how you approach that drug. So, of course, you need a drug that's safe and efficacious, like psilocybin, if it gets regulated. So there, there's, there's an ideal sacrament, I think. Uh, but, you know, before and after, I envision a really, really uh, deep and, and well, um, you know, uh, cultured process of preparing somebody for something that's truly transformative. And I don't, I'm not sure how often that happens. In Eleusis, it was once in your life. Uh, among the Paleo Christians, I don't think it was every Sunday. Uh, that, that's not my argument. I'm saying that at some point in time, uh, there, 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 there comes the desire, right? for that direct encounter with God. And I don't think that that's something that happens every Sunday or is supposed to. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what Jesus meant by, by consuming his blood and finding immortality. You know, there, we don't have a lot of details on, on what that's supposed to mean. So in my case, I can envision once or twice in a lifetime. Outstanding. Uh, right, before we get to the wrap-up question, there's one other thing I wanted to, to get to. You, you, just, you, you just stimulated something in the back of my mind there. Um, Aside from the um, sort of the, the therapeutic uses of, of these type of materials and, and the spiritual uses, um, there's sort of a, another area that I just wanted to quickly ask about. Um, in the sort of the world of uh, cognitive neuroscience or whatever we want to classify it as, there's a lot of weird things that can't be explained entirely uh, from things like uh, the terminal lucidity that happens at the end of life. Uh, for Alzheimer's patients where somehow they, everything comes back to them uh, mm -hmm. before their death, even though they can't recognize their children or the, comes back the moment before their death. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have like uh, down at University of Virginia, the Center for Perceptual Studies, where you got thousands of children that somehow know stuff from a hundred years ago they could never have learned in life uh, mm -hmm. to date. Any interesting uh, stories uh, along the way as you've been do doing your investigations about ways that these substances or sacraments could also allow us beyond the health and the spiritual aspect uh, to uh, explore our conscious, what the mind really is further. Any, any interesting things along those lines? Or I don't know if that's for a second book. <laughs> uh, some of it's for a second book, but I, I, uh, I touch it on, only briefly in the first book, because you can't bump up against the psychedelic literature and right. not fall down the rabbit hole of the near-death literature right. or the other mystical literature. So I'll, I'll mention one paper briefly, just because I think it's one of the most fascinating things I've ever read, and I don't know how to explain it, but I mentioned in the book this, this study by Kenneth Ring and Sharon Cooper in the Journal of Near-Death Studies. I think mm -hmm. it was from about more than 20 years ago in the late 90s. Uh, it's called uh, Near-Death and Out-of-Body Experiences in the Blind a study of apparent eyeless vision. And mm -hmm. I, I mentioned that study because in antiquity, there's this concept of eyeless vision. Uh, the, the, the idea that the, whatever was happening at Eleusis was not something to be perceived by the physical eyes, but something else. And it's, it's an idea you see again and again and again um, in the ancient literature. Even a, a Neoplatonist like Plotinus in the third century AD talks about this faculty of vision that everyone possesses but few people ever, ever use. And the idea that it can be cultivated and, you know, it raises the idea, uh, just speculation that maybe this, this vision can be stimulated by psychedelics in some way. Like in that near death and out of body study, uh, Kenneth Spring and Sharon Cooper, I think they interviewed 31 blind respondents and they were found during their near death experience to have regained their sight. 
or, or to have gotten some kind of a detailed visual awareness, which is, I mean, in my mind, impossible to explain. Um, and, you know, at the end of life, uh, I've read reports about this shared consciousness and these epiphanies. Uh, it's, it's very, very weird stuff. I, I don't see how you can study psychedelics and not study near death at the same time. I mean, for me, they're, they exist on this continuum, which is why I start the book with, with the, that quote that you mentioned about, okay. you know, to die before you die. Uh, is it seems to be the actual key and that's what I'm referring to by the way by the immortality key this idea that if you can die right now in, in this lifetime uh, something happens during that that death process where the you know the ego is dissolved the boundaries are worn thin and uh, vision some kind of vision occurs not not with the physical eyeballs but but some kind of glimpse mm -hmm. of eternity wells up and that's really hard to explain but it's the same thing you find in, in near-death uh, experiences. Um, I think consciousness is, is this giant mystery, and it seems like if we can keep applying some of these scientific protocols, we might just come to an answer. I agree with you on that. I'm gonna sign up for that at the, uh, the Marescu Center. <laughs> <laughs> you're in, you're in, I, man. I'll be there first. Uh, Brian, uh, final uh, question. We, we typically come back to our guests on the show and just uh, ask them about, uh, obviously, mentors and influencers throughout uh, their, their time so far, whether it's during your authoring of this book or obviously your academic career, your career in law, any particular folks that you want to highlight, shout out to at this point that have been really instrumental in keeping you uh, on this path as you've been uh, uncovering these amazing mysteries? Oh, great. I mean, yeah, there's a million. I should start with my wife. Uh, who kept me, kept me sane and grounded over these many, many years uh, and provided a wonderful home for our daughters. This, this, it's not easy on nights and weekends to be married to someone who's just obsessed with the ancient past. So there was, uh, there was certainly that living in the real world trying to make this happen. Uh, but, you know, it started when I was a teenager and my, my Greek professor, uh, Dr. Henry V. Bender at St. Joe's Prep when I was a young man, uh, he was the person who not only got me into Latin and Greek, at a time in my life that was very difficult. Uh, but he, he was the one who uh, helped me get into college. He, he's the guy who told me, you might wanna, you know, you might wanna visit a couple of schools, Brian, uh, <laughs> while, you're, while you're thinking about this. And then there was Joe Pucci at Brown University who took me under his, his wing and the whole classics department there uh, who uh, I think were slightly disappointed when I went to law school instead of becoming a classics professor or priests, which is what I wanted to do. Uh, but then I, I found equal mentors in, in the law. Um, and it's, it's been that way ever since. And you know, when all these ideas come together and you're trying to publish a book, it's just about the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, so uh, I, I looked to, to authors who knew what they were doing and reached out to Leslie Kane, this wonderful journalist and Graham Hancock who wrote the foreword. And these people were just so kind to me. Uh, and so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm missing a lot of names here. Uh, but I just, uh, I, th I think that uh, I've been shown nothing but kindness from all these people uh, whose work, you know, I, I always respected and wanted to try and take a step further. Um, and so uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to pay that back someday. Wonderful. Wonderful. Really, uh, really inspiring and saying stuff, Brian, and wishing the best uh, with it moving forward. Uh, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode on podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Brian Morescu, author of The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name. Uh, Brian, thank you.